Hi there, it's Dr. Purcell. I'm so happy to be with you today. Hope you're having a great day so far. We are going to be talking about gluten. I know it's in the news. Friends, family, people you meet on the street are all going gluten-free. What does it mean for you? What does it mean for your health? What's all the hullabaloo? And um, should you pay attention to it, really? So that's what we're going to cover today in this Facebook Live. And the answer is it depends. And you will be able to make that decision better when we get to the end of this discussion. So what is gluten? Gluten is a protein found in three grains, wheat, barley, and rye. And yes, all wheat-containing grains have gluten, but sometimes they come under different names, and you might not be aware of what they are. That includes spelt, kamut, farro, and semolina, to name a few. Okay, they're all wheat-containing grains. So, you know, some of the most obvious gluten-containing products are going to be your breads, pastas, cookies, crackers, baked goods, a lot of your processed foods. Then we kind of get to the middle of the road, less obvious gluten-containing foods, Foods, things like flour tortillas, fried or battered foods. You may not be realizing that they are battered with wheat flour or a gluten-containing flour. Uh, croutons I see a lot. You know, they just show up on a salad. And you're thinking, oh, I ordered a salad, but then it's got croutons, so now your salad's contaminated with gluten. Um, and then we have the even less obvious foods, things like soups and dips and sauces and salad dressings, deli meats, uh, even some rotisserie chickens, things like that. So at first glance, it may seem relatively easy to avoid gluten. But unless you are a super label reader and you really look twice and make sure that it says, the product says that it's gluten-free, chances are you probably will be consuming some gluten. So this is really difficult for folks who are diagnosed with celiac disease. So this is a condition where um, it's actually a gluten allergy and it damages the lining of the intestine. And, you know, if someone you love or you or you've heard about celiac disease, you know, cannot eat one little tiny, teeny piece of gluten at all. Um, it's easy to be con um, be contaminated, and it causes a lot of health problems. Um, so really, celiac patients need some special direction, and I'm happy uh, to help, and I have a lot of patients with celiac disease, and they need some really individualized, specific coaching for that. But so what is the story with gluten, really? Like, why gluten? Why now? Why, why is everyone talking about it? What's going on? So there are some working theories around gluten and maybe what has kind of triggered so many people to become sensitive to it. So the first is the hybridization of wheat. Wheat, over the last hundred years, used to be a really big, tall crop, and now it's become a dwarfed version of what it used to be. And gluten has been kind of um, condensed and concentrated in the smaller crop. And so you know, there's just more gluten. That's one working theory. The next one is... The pre-harvest spraying of an herbicide called glycophosphate onto crops. Glycophosphate, you know, there's been some talk, you know, is it a carcinogen? Is it cancer causing? Uh, it's definitely causing some liver kidney damage, some digestive health compromise. And um, if you've never heard of glycophosphate, there was quite a bit of media buzz around it in November of 2016. I encourage you to check out some of the Huffington Post articles on it and FDA being required to test or not being required to test and really how that's affecting our health and maybe some of the food items that you're 
buying or eating or serving to your family. So take a look at that. And then, you know, just having compromised digestion is the third biggest working theory of why we're being sensitive to gluten now and maybe perhaps we weren't before. So our food supply has been compromised. Digestive systems are weaker. You know, statistics are one in every three Americans is struggling with a digestive issue. And, you know, our digestive systems are weaker. So perhaps we just can't handle the the gluten protein like we once could and, and it's causing some problems. It's making it hard to digest with a weakened digestive system. So, you know, what if you're in good health? Hey, hey doc, I'm in good health. I never have a reason to come see you. Okay, so if you've not on any medications and you don't have any diagnoses and you don't feel sick and you feel good, you probably can eat some gluten. So good for you. Go ahead and eat some. Now, those are not my patients, and those aren't the people um, that call or email or schedule appointments. So who else is out there, right? So if you're not in perfect health and you have a diagnosis or two or three and you're on a couple of medications and maybe you don't feel that great and you think that you could feel better, then it could be a good idea for you to get off gluten and see if you start to feel better. Maybe you'll have more energy, clarity of thinking. Um, the list goes on and on, really. Now, if someone is struggling with immune, autoimmune, or thyroid problems, I recommend avoiding gluten pretty much across the board to that subset of people and or patients. Now, there's celiac disease, and then there's non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and there's you know, this is like 1% of the population, and this goes into a really nice hunk of the population, you know, 8, 10% of the population. So folks, you know, they're not celiac, but they're sensitive to gluten, and there is a way to test, and a lot of alternative doctors are able to do that testing for you and help you get some answers and help you regain your health as a result. But if you're having, let's say you do fall into that category of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, um, causes inflammation, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, joint pain, multiple sclerosis, eczema, fatigue. I mean, the list literally goes on and on. And what's happening is, is that it's compromising your digestion. So your ability to absorb vitamins and minerals and feed the other parts of your body. And that's really essential, right? Because when we eat, our body sucks out the zinc and the vitamin E and the calcium and the magnesium and sends it to our brain, our bones, our hair, our skin, our nails, etc. The list goes on and on, right? So we need those. Those are our essential building blocks. So avoiding gluten is also always recommended if you have celiac disease or if you have a, fam a very close family member um, that has celiac disease, um, which again is an autoimmune allergy to gluten. So here's what you need to know if you want to start eating gluten light, as I call it, or you want to start to avoid gluten in your diet. So there are no health risks to avoiding gluten. Okay, so you're not going to become deficient in something, especially if you start eating a fresh whole food diet, which I recommend. I don't recommend saying, oh, I'm going to eat gluten free and then just taking your processed gluten food and then substituting processed gluten free food. Okay, that is not good nutrition. So you weren't eating good nutrition here. That is not good nutrition there. So what we want to do is we want to get out take the gluten away, and then we want to add in fresh, whole food, which I'm going to talk about. So if you are, in fact, like tens of thousands of people out there who are having symptoms and your body is inflamed and you're on a medication, probably avoiding gluten will be a good idea for you. It, it could only help and enhance your health in positive ways. Okay, But I do want to say this, because there is a caveat. If you stop eating all gluten, and let's say six months from now, you want to go through the testing. You want to say like, well, I want to make sure I don't have celiac disease, or I want to test for non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or I want to do the genetic test because I just found out that my first cousin you know, has celiac, and I haven't been feeling that great, and she had all these mystery symptoms. If you avoid gluten, None of that testing will be accurate, okay, because you have to be eating gluten to get accurate test results, and this is a very, very important point. 
So if you avoid gluten, let's say you go on a gluten-free diet tomorrow and six months from now you want to get tested, avoiding the gluten will prevent you from getting an accurate diagnosis. Okay, that's what you need to know. So you have to be able to eat the gluten to get an accurate test result. So now the next question is, well, doc, how much gluten do I need to be eating? And the answer is the equivalent of three quarters of a slice of wheat bread every day for six weeks. So perhaps you have some health challenges and you want to see if avoiding gluten will help you. So where do you start? And your little monkey mind, the little monkey up there might be saying, oh, no pizza, no bread, what? I totally get it. I'm from an East Coast Italian family. I grew up on Italian bread and pasta and cheese and lasagna and all the, the really rich Italian food. But when I moved out West, it was you know to find my own way and to rebuild my health. And so along the journey, what I figured out was that the pasta, the Italian bread, and all that cheese really weren't doing me any favors. So at the beginning, it is a sacrifice. It is a change. You're going to feel like you miss those things. But, you know, it's kind of like when every door closes, a window opens, and what you're going to regain is your energy, your clarity of mind, your health. You're going to decrease your inflammation, and the payoff is totally worth it. So you may want to go gluten-free, and you, or you may want to go gluten-light. But I have five tips that I want to share with you today to make this transition easier. Okay? So chin up. I'm here for you. So number one, eating out. If you're going to eat out, I suggest that you choose the destination. Okay? Take control of it. You know, a lot of times, you know, you capitalize on your friends or your family's indecisiveness and you say, don't worry about it, I'll choose. And then you can go online ahead of time. You can select a place that has healthier and fresher options. They may or may not have a gluten-free menu or what a lot of restaurants are doing now is they will have like a star and a capital G and a capital F next to the menu item to let you know that it's gluten-free. And that totally takes the guesswork and the stress out of having to make substitutions at a restaurant and potentially having your server make a mistake and deliver your salad with croutons on it would be a good example. So that's number one. So take control of the destination if you're going to be eating out. Number two is increase your vegetable intake. You know, the average American only eats vegetables with dinner. There's no vegetables with lunch. There's maybe, you know, a piece of lettuce on the sandwich. You know, no vegetables at breakfast, piece of lettuce on the sandwich at lunch, and then vegetables at dinner. So if you just increase your vegetable consumption by two or three vegetables per meal, it's going to fill you up, and then you're not going to miss the bread or the crackers or the sandwich, right? So you just kind of want to crowd it out with some more vegetables. Um, another idea is, you know, just get your burger wrapped in lettuce, no bun. Order a rice bowl or a quinoa bowl with, you know, protein and vegetables on top or sweet potatoes, and then you avoid the need for a wrap or a sandwich. And you can try zucchini noodles. I love zucchini noodles in place of pasta. I also use spaghetti squash in place of pasta. So, you know, there are a lot of nice alternatives out there for you. So that's number two. And number three is start eating some more resistant starch. Resistant starch is um, so, so beneficial, and I'm going to list what they all are. But in essence, going gluten-free doesn't mean you're going low-carb, and it doesn't mean that you have to cut out all the carbs because there is this extremely medicinal group of starches called resistant starches. And things that fall into this category are rice, potatoes, including sweet potatoes, so all potatoes, peas, beans, lentils, winter squash, and quinoa, right? So you can eat all of those things. So you're just getting out the gluten, right? Remember the wheat, barley, and rye out the door, and then these things come in to support you so that you feel satisfied and full 
and you're still eating the healthy carbs. So resistant starches are called resistant because they resist digestion and digestive conversion to quick sugars. So they're a much slower burn in the body. They promote energy. They stabilize your blood sugar and they support healthy digestive flora. And that's important, right? Because we were just talking about how compromised digestive systems are nowadays. Number four is watch out for the gluten-free substitutes, right? So <laughs> this is my favorite saying, you know, a gluten-free cake is still a cake. Just because it says gluten-free doesn't mean you get to eat 15 gluten-free pancakes when normally you would have eaten three, right? So the same rules apply, you know, um, the non-gluten foods, let's say like the crackers that you're seeing and the cookies and the muffins and the, and the bagels out there, right, they're still processed. And so what we want to do is we want to walk away from processed and we want to get towards more whole and fresh food. So for recipes and ideas, you can check out my cookbook, Feed Your Cells, Seven Ways to Make Health Food Fast, Easy, and Gluten-Free. This is my gluten-free cookbook. It's available on Amazon to help you make this transition a little easier. And then tip number five is plan ahead with healthy snacks. I always have at least two snacks in my purse anytime I leave the house to do an errand. And examples of healthy snacks are going to be apples or any kind of fruit. You know, apples, bananas are easy, but, you know, I'll throw a peach in, a pear. There'll maybe be some baby clementines I'll have in my purse. And then vegetables, you know, a bag of cucumber slices, celery sticks, carrots, um, those little guacamole packets, I love those. You know, if you pack them in your kids' lunches, you could throw those in your purse and then just eat them with cucumber slices. Nuts and nut butters, individual packets of nut butters, very easy. You know, even some dark chocolate you can put in your purse. But these will save you when you're out, you know, longer than you expected or you tried to squeeze in another errand and your blood sugar starts dipping and you're online at Costco, and then right in front of you is, you know, the pizza concession stand. You just reach into your pocket or your purse or whatever you've got, and you start eating your apple instead, and that will really save you. So I hope today's discussion on gluten has been helpful and has helped you decide whether or not it would be in your best interest to embark on a gluten-free lifestyle. But you know, I care about you and I want you to feel your best. So make it a great week and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.